E2 be indicative of all sorts of other problems, but for now, let's stand turn to hymn 28, would you? Hymn 28, the hymn is called How Great Thou Art, How Great Thou Art. And with this song, let's let's praise and adore the one who gave us life, the one who made this world. You heard about the scientists who said, "Oh, I can." The science scientists today can do everything that God did. We can make all the elements that God made. We can reconstruct this. We can clone that. We don't need God anymore. And so this believer, he said, "Well, go ahead and demonstrate." And so the scientist grabs a little piece of dirt and he goes, "Wait." The believer says, "You got to start with your own dirt." Mm. <laughs> It's interesting, no matter how far back you want to kick the can, no matter how far back you want to kick the can, you can kick it all the way back to however many years ago, but ultimately it all starts from the one. The one that we're going to praise when we say, how great thou art. And it's like the psalmist said, it's like many biblical poets have said, did you create this? Remember the book of Job, beautiful poetry. Did you create this? Have you entered into the treasury of the snow? Do you know how to make all the millions and billions and trillions of snowflakes all look exactly different from each other? Yeah. Oh, I don't know how to do that. I can do that with 15 of them. Well, then maybe focus on saying how great thou art instead of how great I be. You know what I mean? Amen. Something about staying humble. Something about staying humble. This song is just the one to do it. Let's sing him. <clears throat> 28, how great thou art. Would you play the first note, Lord? Here we go. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I can have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power grew up, the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to me. How great thou art, how great.
seated. What a song, huh? Boy. <clears throat> like I say, we'll sing again toward the end. Usher, will you come forward? We'll take an offering at this time. <clears throat> Thanks, Kev, for standing in. Appreciate that. Got a couple, three families not quite here. One pulling in. Sickness and all that. We want people to be careful. We don't need our churches to be a breeding ground of bacteria if we can help it. I get that. Um, <laughs> don't do that to me. <laughs> Just for that, you can pray. I don't know why I do that. Father, we love you and thank you for an opportunity to be in church. I ask, dear God, that you would. Lord, just be amongst us today. We ask that you would allow this time to be profitable for thee, that we would hear truth, that we would desire to grow and we just ask dear god that you would be with offerings meet our financial needs and uh, just bless our church please in jesus name i pray amen, amen. you can uh as you guys know i give online tithely uh set it up with auto pay because instead of going hey babe i forgot to check can you make it out to the church? And then I have to do like in subtle sign language how much to make it out for so the church can't see. And it's just like, so I just set it up on auto recurring payment. Boop, done. Some folks say, I don't want to get involved in that. I'll just go back and play. Yeah, keep the lights on and keep the heat on, right? Yeah. At this point, keeping the heat on, I'd be a little more challenging than keeping the lights on, you know. Now, I appreciate everybody pitching in. My church, my responsibility. And uh, gone, old oh, guys, if they aren't gone by now, they will be in a generation or two. Gone are and or will be the days when people show up to church to spectate. But the days are coming in which this modern new evangelical big church movement is going to decay and crumble. And the and this is people say you're a mean old prophet of doom. I thought it was Kevin's job this morning to be mean. No, no, no. Actually, I think it's a ray of hope in that a lot of the spectator based church stuff is going to fall away because it, like many other things it, it's just it's not rooted in timeless principle right but but ladies and gentlemen i firmly believe that there will always be small medium sized many large i'm sure churches that persist that aren't interested in people coming to, to spectate but everybody coming together to participate in other words the future of the church is not people going to church the future of the church is people assembling together to be the church to each other and to a lost and dying world and uh, people say, you need to persuade me that the world is lost and dying. I do not, in fact. <laughs> Just look out your window. I do not. <laughs> Nor do I have to persuade you that 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 uh, much of what goes on inside the church is, is, is uh, the behaviors and beliefs of which are typically associated with a lost and dying world. Right. You say, does that mean they're not a real church? I don't know if I can say that. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. You remember the book of 1 Corinthians? That was a pretty tricky letter to navigate, wasn't it? Imagine you're at the Church of Corinth and you're like, we're doing great. We just sang How Great Thou Art and we're fixing to sing uh, It Will Be Worth It All or Wonderful to Be a Christian, you know? And then you get this letter from Paul and he's like, hey guys, listen. You're not doing that hot. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, it appears that at least for a little while, the Church of Corinth listened, yeah. right? And in 2 Corinthians, he writes, and he's like, all right, we got a little bit more work to do, but we're making our way, right? Oh, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Now, I know we've been kind of getting back to the, the fun Vacation Bible school style. I don't care what people think. Again, they say, I don't do that in my old church. Well, I'm thankful, and I'm sure they're doing it right, and I'm doing it wrong. But I enjoyed a little bit of review with just a little bit of incentive. Number one, so you can see my amazing throwing skills. You're laughing because of how impressed you are, obviously. That's a normal reaction, I'm sure. <laughs> no objection from you. Uh, so, but... Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I've mimicked three of the sports, basketball, football, and, and stop, and baseball. 
I almost swung a bat for throwing. That is, that's how non-athletic I am. I've never done hockey though. So if you see me up here with like a hockey stick and like a Tootsie Roll, just, <laughs> it's not going to end well. <laughs> But so I've ordered some. I've ordered some. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know this. I've ordered some top tier candy. Okay. None of that. Yeah. None of this dum dum. I'm not being rude. They're actually called dum dums. You know what I mean? The, you know, the lollipop. None of that stuff. No double bubble. Okay. We're talking Twix, M&M, Snickers. And this is really the kicker. And I can't have any of this stuff, by the way. So you know it's self giving love. Kevin's all, oh, I can't have gluten in Sunday school. Do you hear him complaining about it? Clearly you did. He did a lot. And then he's like, but I made it taste better with butter and cheese. I can't have the butter and cheese either. <laughs> you don't get to play the violin. Well, at least it's not the world's smallest violin. At least. It... <laughs> but anyway, here's the, here's the kicker. Strawberry. That actually. And you know what? Honestly, strawberry is, is God's sweet. Okay. Yeah. I'll rationalize my way around that. Sure. <laughs> Um, but the ones I got, the, the real kickers for next week. So be excited. Get excited about this. This is fine. I'm excited to go to church today. Why? To learn from God? Yeah, that too. But <laughs> but I got the Reese's for Valentine's Day. Everybody knows that Reese's peanut butter cups are fine. But when they come out with the specialty ones, like the eggs or the hearts, they're just better. And someone say, oh, that's just your imagination. I submit to you that it is not. There is something distinctly different about the Reese's that they put out. I think it's a better peanut butter to chocolate ratio. Um, but he can't have too much because I tried the ones with double peanut butter. It's like, eh, I'm just eating a chocolate and peanut butter sandwich at this point, which is good. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> All right. I have a question. Did anybody try this before? Um, somebody submitted online a thing that was supposed to be that people might think is abhorrent. But they actually said it was good. And then when the editor of this article tried it, she said, wow, it was way better than I thought. That it goes way back to some Dutch tradition or whatever it is. I'm probably mangling the actual history of it. But it's a grilled cheese with Swiss and peanut butter. Anybody ever tried anything like that? I'm just curious. Don't, don't say no. You, no, you're being dismissive. But I think that it would be – I'm going to – I can't. I'm just going to be real honest with you. The bread, the cheese, the – I know, Kev. I know. I know. But the cheese, anyway. So I, I have vegan cheese in my, it's not real cheese. It, it, it's odorless and tasteless. It's not even a thing. <laughs> it's just there for a look to trick your brain into thinking there's something on that burger. I have gluten-free bread. Um, again, it's basically a flavorless platform on which to put whatever meat I'm putting. I, I, you know it is. But if someone who can actually eat this stuff wants to try a grilled cheese sandwich with Swiss and then some peanut butter on the inside, now, now, listen, listen, I see the judgment on your face. Listen, fine, whatever. If you want me, you don't want to try new things. Pearl. All right, here we go. Vanilla wafers and tuna fish? Huh. Don't knock it, though. Don't knock it. That's the thing. That's what we're all here for. <laughs> and what was the other one? I knew you were going to do that. I'm like, the second one's going to be the Valentine's Banquet sign up. This Saturday night, Valentine's Banquet for married couples. Please make plans to come to the Valentine's Banquet. Um, it gets crazy. Now, again, that's the Baptist version of crazy, which means we might actually laugh once in a while. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> right? But, uh, but no, it's so fun. I love the Valentine's Banquet. And uh, she's doing this. So in the words of a famous theologian, money, 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 money. Um, that's actually not a theologian at all. But uh, show me the money. Show me the money, she says. But it's 20 bucks per couple. If you say, hey, I, 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 I would come, but I really can't spare 20 bucks, I will totally cover you. That's not a problem at all. Please just, just sign up and just write. What do we want them to write on the sheet? Just sign up and maybe... I don't know. I don't want anybody to feel like they've got to put something by their name in front of everybody. But just let me know. Shoot me a text or, or DM or something. Just say, hey, Britt, love you. Love the banquet. Can't come to the money. I will pay for you. Okay? I just I want every couple to be able to come to the Valentine's banquet. Any couple is invited. I've invited people from work. Um, I invited – yeah, in fact, um, uh, Cody and Liz, they're coming, and he's my coworker, and they're a couple uh, – uh, it's just great. They don't have to be Christians. I just want couples to be here at the Valentine's banquet. And Ray has prepared an hour and a half long message for everybody. And uh... 
Yeah. No, it's probably just going to be 10 minutes, but it's going to be this Saturday or whatever it is. I don't care. You could preach for an hour. You'd have me. But um, but typically the, the the lesson is probably just a 15, whatever you have planned, you know, the short lesson and just say, hey, you know, here's just a thought for you. Uh, and we've always had had a great time. And it's actually a really cool time to spend with other couples and to be like, it's just kind of it's in a silly way of putting it. We just kind of let our hair down and just have a great time at the church family. And for me personally, I've said this before, I will continue saying it. It is the highlight of, of, of year of the year in terms of church events and function. I love the Valentine's banquet. We clear these chairs out of here. We set up tables and, and we're all in the theme is Downton Abbey. And she's, Oh, is that what you were going to say, Cheryl? Yeah, the theme is Downton Abbey. You say, I don't know what Downton Abbey is. That makes it even more fun. Just take a guess. Right. <laughs> and, uh, or just Google it, whatever. I'm just Adam. Ray is our speaker. Yep. And, uh, and so he's the one who's going to preach the hour and a half long message I mentioned to you. No, but, uh, so, so, uh, I'm, just, I'm wearing a suit, right? I might get a dapper hat, you know, like a bowler hat. I don't know if they had those in Downton Abbey, but the, I think the butler did, didn't he? Bowler hat. So I'm going to come up with something, uh, I'm going to plan it last minute, like I do with everything, obs, uh, obviously. But um, but I think it'll be good. I think it'll be great. No, I'm going to put some effort into it. I'm encouraged. Amber's like, you better. She went. She was. She's already been shopping for like weeks, and she's like, I got this because this is accurate to the 1900s. I got this because this is accurate to the Victorian. And I'm like, Whew. it was easier for me when it was like 1970s. Wasn't that last year? Amber just got some bell bottoms and like one of them long, like, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't do the tie dye. I couldn't, I don't, I, I couldn't find one. Yeah, you did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But this year is Downton Abbey and uh, next year it'll probably be like the eighties or nineties. And then it's cutting a little bit too close to home for me to be throwback. Like, let's not play around. Let's go back to like the, well, fifties. I don't know if you can do fifties. Was romance even allowed in the fifties? I don't know. That was, we did. Oh, the nifty fifties. We did do it. Oh, romance was definitely allowed because we had a great night. It was awesome. Valentine's Bank, it was so fun. All right, so that is this Saturday night, 5.30. Plan for about three hours, 5.30 to 8.30. Um, shh. It will probably be a little longer. No, we, but we have such a blast. Seriously, it's going to be awesome. Um, there will be attendance on Sunday morning. No, I'm just joking. Now. <laughs> but uh, we do plan anything carefully so nobody's out till like 11 or 12. Y'all can get your eight hours and be back in time for church and all that fun stuff. <laughs> Look, I know. What's that, Kim? We were making rather merry. I love it. Um, now, I don't get eight, but it is my obligation to recommend eight. Nobody gets eight. Does anybody get eight? Yeah, some people do. It's fine. Yeah. Well, I tell you, it's eleven thirty, so I should be starting. But I will leave you with this one anecdote before we jump in. Turn to uh, turn to the book of Acts, would you? Acts chapter sixteen. It was so cold, we felt it beneficial to bring our chickens in. Uh, for the cold snap over the weekend. Now, we only have three right now. That's just the way it's panned out. Um, there were some there were some predators, and tried as we might, we've done all the fences and lighting, and there were they get very crafty. And you say, that's animal cruelty. Well, not to the predators. They seem to do just fine, you know what I mean? So circle of life. But we have done, we moved the coop, Corey and I, Corey mostly, <laughs> moved this really heavy coop to the other side of the house where the light comes on. We haven't had any more trouble, thankfully. Also because every predator on earth is, it's, probably frozen solid, but our chickens, our chickens were inside because we really, the Bible says that a righteous man regards the life of his beast. And we want to be very careful about that. Um, and so we brought in the chickens. Are you going to complain? Okay. What? <laughs> he lives downstairs. So. <laughs> um, I was thinking about something that we were talking about here in Sunday school. Okay. Um, this morning. But if, if you think about like the laws, the laws of, I was thinking about a song this morning. Um, and uh, if you think about like the, the laws of man, mm -hmm. um, the song is a little overbearing, but I do kind of get something from it. Um, he says, um, I don't need um, the laws of man to tell me what to do. It's, oh, yeah. Uh, Supposed to be a Christian song. Sure, sure. A little overbearing, but yeah. Um, he says, I don't really need the laws of man to tell me what to do. Uh, but I just think it's very interesting to think about how we treat the law of man versus how we treat basically the law of God, the, 
what laws he puts in place for us to to live by so yep. that we live righteously or live, you know, on a on a good path. Sure. As human beings. Like, yeah, yeah. If you just follow the laws of, of man, you I don't think that you're gonna be living the same way as if you follow the law of God. I think I think now there's a dichotomy between the laws of man and the laws of God. Let me tackle that in one second. Uh, I was just going to finish the chicken anecdote real quick. Um, we brought our chickens in and so that they wouldn't freeze. And I was talking about, I segued there from like getting seven or eight hours of sleep a night, which is what the goal is. The chicken decided very early, ere the sun was up, our rooster Foghorn decided to greet the sun. <laughs> yes, Foghorn, Foghorn Leghorn, that's what this one's name is. And Foghorn decided he was going to greet the sun. And he was in the bathroom the first night, which is separated from our room by a thin wall. And I had my hearing aids out when we sleep. And I woke up. And I, it was five something, which isn't super early, but it was before the sunrise, which was disappointing. And, uh, and I said to Amber, I said, I'm, I'm just getting up. There's no way. So I got up and I used the restroom. And I was still thinking maybe I could get some sleep. While I was in the restroom, the rooster crowed and... And we're in a closed space, guys, very small bathroom. And it reverberated and resounded. And I just, oh, it's so loud. And I did not have my hearing aids in. It was really bad. So we did not get a lot of sleep. So we put them out in the foyer, the, foyer, the little mud room with the heat lamp is perfectly good for them. And they loved it. And sure enough, the last couple of mornings. So it's warming up. They've got a perfectly warm coop uh, when it's, you know, 20, 30 degrees, but not, you know, negative 40 or whatever it was, wind chill. I don't know. It, the more you talk about it, the, the colder it gets, by the way. Ten years from now, it will be negative 112 with a, with a negative 316 wind chill, by the way, when I tell my grandchildren. So anyways, um, so segueing into, and I just want to answer the question really quick. We talk about man's law and God's law, right? What's the difference? Well, let me give you a couple of pointers really quick. You say, well, this isn't in the, uh, in the note. It's okay. That's what we're here in church for, right, guys? Yeah. All right, good. So um, man's law and God's law. Are there any laws in America that are not reflective of, uh, reflective of God's law? Well, sure there are. Sure there are. Absolutely. Um, we say, should there be? Well, no. I, I think that there are two bases, two basis for laws in the United States. One is the law of God, transcendent moral. There is no law. Let me be very clear. There is no law that is not about a moral issue. Every law has to do with morality. People say, you can't legislate morality. That's the only thing you can legislate. In other words, I can't make a law about what color shirt Steve should wear. That's not a moral issue, right? right? But if I make a law that says, um, Steve, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something for, for Steve. Like, I'm trying to think of one that won't offend anybody. Let's just go to a big one that Steve can't kill somebody, right? That's, that's a moral law because we're talking about the sanctity of life. Yes, Susan. Right, I, I thought about that one, but I'm like, well, it's not a law, yet, you know, but right, nor should it be, I suppose. But here's the thing, moral issues, there should be laws around moral issues. That's all you can make a law around justly. Now, the law of God, Romans chapter 13, why do we have government? The government is to protect and serve. That's what the government's role is for, and to bring the sword, Romans chapter 13, on the heads of evildoers, metaphorically speaking, sometimes literally speaking, right? Sanctity of life. So when I look at the laws of America, I have a moral obligation to observe the law and say, is this law in accordance with God's moral principles? If so, in some way or another, then I have a responsibility to obey the law if it doesn't contradict God's moral code. I don't like wearing a seatbelt. I can rationalize why I, why I shouldn't have to wear a seatbelt. But if it contradict the law of God for me to have to wear a seatbelt, I, I don't think I can build a case that it does. Someone else might be able to. Have fun with that. I can't. Does that make sense? So I wear a seatbelt. I'm going to be subject to the higher powers, Romans chapter 13. But are there laws that circumvent or, or are contrary to the law of God? Absolutely there are, now especially. So what do we do with those laws? Well, like I told you at first, there are two sources for laws, two basic laws. One, God's revealed moral principle that we didn't convene upon and decide, we discovered them through revelation. Many cultures besides Christian cultures have had laws of don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat, right? Because they recognize even morals that are written on our hearts, okay? But the second basis for a law is what's called expressive individualism, in which it says, I feel this way, therefore nothing can violate this. Because it goes back to Jefferson's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what happens when my pursuit of happiness runs contrary to your pursuit of happiness? You see what I'm saying? 
And so laws that are built around the individual expressiveness of pursuit of happiness are troublesome because happiness is entirely subjective. And so if I say, and remember, uh, 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 well, there's all sorts of, all sorts. I don't want to give too many specific examples because I don't want to go on too many rabbit trail. But just as a very quick answer to the question, if you obey nothing but man's law, in many ways, you'll be A-OK and better than a lot of the country's doing, OK? But there are some laws that have begun to run aground or have found their origin and running aground and running contrary, rather, to the law of God as expressed in morals and in the Bible. What do we do with those laws? Well, if we have a moral obligation, obligation to obey God above all, when there is a law that goes against God's word, we have a moral obligation to the first law that, that existed long before America itself, let alone these new laws that have been in the last 10 to 15 years. So remember, please remember, when it comes to laws today, typically laws are not, hmm, I'll say this, the central focus of legislation now really has shifted from what is right to rather what is offensive or potentially harmful according to one person's POV or point of view. Does that make sense? Offensive, rude, potentially hurtful does not necessarily mean wrong. I'm just saying, because that's all subjective. It's all subjective. There's right and wrong, and then there's this person's pursuit of happiness is being inhibited by the presence of this law. So we have to ab abdicate that law, um, such as uh, Article 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, right? That was ruled against. You remember that? And they said, well, we can't have this law because this person got married up in Canada, and then she came back to America, and her, her wife died, and she wanted to collect particular tax exemption, and the law says no. So they, instead of saying, well, this is what the law says, and it's based on a moral code from Scripture, they said, we're going to change the law so as to accommodate this person's pursuit of happiness. And when we begin to make changes like that, for better or for worse, that's when you leave an objective standard for law and move on to a subjective standard for law. And that's where it becomes a problem. And that's why we're seeing so many things in the United States of America that are problematic, is because regardless of, of the people involved, and here's the, here's the reality, with laws, you can't make everybody happy. That's what boundaries do. And, and as much as I want to see everybody happy, the, the, it all goes back to what I was earlier, saying earlier, is freedom is found within embracing that which is fundamentally moral as revealed in God's law, and seeking accommodation to individual subjective exemptions to that will only lead to, to ruin. Uh, so anyway, so as an answer. That, uh, you watched that video on singing. He, he probably doesn't really live by much of man's laws. He probably lives mostly on God's laws. Yeah, in fact, the Apostle Paul touched it on the fact that where there's there, there are civilizations where man's law doesn't exist and people are not aware of certain moral failures or boundaries, we live according to what God has revealed in our hearts. In fact, I would submit to you that any brief study of human civilization pre-codified law would reveal that everybody knows it's wrong to kill or steal. Does that make sense? I think there's an innate knowledge of that, that we didn't have to sit around and go as cavemen and say, hmm, og stole you know, Oog's, Og and Oog, they didn't really have a good naming system back then, but it did, it was there. Og stole Oog's meat. Is this wrong? No, you didn't have to ask. You already knew, right, because of morality. So anyways, all right, I want to move on to Acts chapter 16. We're 10 minutes, a little bit late, which is uh, Corey's fault this week, so blame him. And uh, no, all right. All right, Acts chapter 15. We got five verses to go through this morning, and so I want to start with a quick review, and then we'll read our five verses. Review, again, I don't have, I don't have, yeah, but... Here's a quick question. Last week's lesson, what were the false teachers called? Uh, Paul dealt with them in Galatians, and we doubled them in Acts chapter 15. The false teachers starts with a J. Kim. Judaizers. These were particular groups of Jewish uh, uh, followers of Yahweh uh, that had uh, adopted the Mosaic law as their bedrock of, of obeying God, which was normal and understandable. But when Jesus came, he said, I am the temple. I fulfilled the law. The final sacrifice has been made. The circumcision is now spiritual. You understand the idea? It's all of these feast dates and all of these dietary laws and all of these ritual pointed to Jesus. And so now there's freedom in Christ, which is awesome. But they didn't think it was that awesome. They thought, this is a little bit too freestyle for us. We're going to go and bring some order to the church. And so they left the church at Jerusalem, went up to Antioch, and started telling some stuff. So how did Paul and Barnabas respond? Not by, not by doing this. I'm not really sure what this is. but Yeah, they responded by, by, the Bible said they had no small dissension with them, and they said, this is wrong. This is wrong. Paul and Barnabas responded negatively to it. Remember, this is before Paul and Barnabas uh, had split. And Barnabas went to Cyprus with John Mark, and Paul went up north with Silas, and they began the second missionary journey. This is before that. It's Acts chapter 15. And so um, they said, no, this is not right. This is not right. So as a result of their disagreement, 
uh, they had they they met in Jerusalem and had a council where James would very likely to pastor this church in Jerusalem. And these pastors got together and 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 they went through this and they said, okay. Reflecting on what Jesus said, does it make sense for these guys to be calling people back into the rituals of Judaism, especially if they're not even Jews? What was the result? What was their answer? Anybody know? It's pretty simple. Kev. Fornication, things strangled, uh, things offered to idols, drinking blood. These were things that they said, okay, to enter the synagogue to worship Christ, uh, without having any sort of hue, and we'll see that another another example of deference or giving up things for unity today in our scripture. But he said those are the things we should stay away from. But but there are no rituals or circumcision or dietary laws necessary to be in Christ. So uh, the key word in last week's lesson was they found something on a furlough. <laughs> William Wallace's last word in Braveheart. My guys, freedom. Yes, freedom. They found freedom uh, and a, on a fiasco furlough, right? Um, furlough fiasco. That's what it was. So they found freedom in Christ. See, that's what it is. I don't have candy up here. So you guys are like, it's really not worth it, Brett. It's not worth it. Y'all are thinking of the answers in your head, but you're like, I'm not even going to say anything. It's fine. I've been punished. Okay. I get it. I'm going to bring herbal cough drops next time i'm gonna do recolas all right anyway <laughs> they're actually not that bad all right if it's on a tv commercial you can know that it's going to happen from over here in the in the in the east wing west wing all right so really quick i want to show you just a very brief recap and then we'll jump into the lesson if you'll recognize this route before too long as paul's first missionary journey he went from antioch to italia uh, to, or excuse me, to Salamis and Paphos in Crete, right? And that's where John Mark took off and went to Jerusalem for one reason or another. Then they went up to Perga, Antioch, Iconium, Lister, Derby, went back and then went to Italia, that seaport, and then from there went back to Antioch. After that, they went up to Jerusalem, down on a map, but up geographically, right, or topographically. Um, they went up to Jerusalem, then they came back down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then from Antioch, now Paul and Silas are going to take off and go on a second missionary journey. And I'm going to show you from Scripture that the motivating factor for this second missionary journey was undoing the damage done by the Judaizers, at least at first. So we're going to undo all that stuff, and we're going to start with a new map. It's Paul's second missionary journey. First stop was right here in the region of Derby, Lystra, and Iconium, and that's where we're going to start our text this morning. Five verses, chapter 16, I'm going to read them to you. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for the keep that were ordained to the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Lord God, I love you, and I thank you for the opportunity to, to share from the Word of God what you, what you have preserved for all time for us to benefit from, learn from, and grow in, Lord. I, I ask that you would be with me as I try to teach, and that you'd be with the minds of everybody in this room, that we would listen and allow the Bible to shape our minds, especially if we sit in an increasingly uh, uh, confused and, uh, uh, well, confused culture, Lord. And I, I ask that you would allow the Word of God to continue to keep us on a straight and narrow and straighten us where we've gone a little bit awry. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, so a man of good report is the lesson this morning. Paul and Silas now launch upward toward the Derby Lister Iconium complex with one goal in mind to undo the damage by the Judaizers. And if you look at verse four, it's very clear that this is the parent, uh, excuse me, that it's very clear that this was their constant mission to give the good news that the Judaizers were wrong. Were wrong. Verse four says, and as they went through the city, they delivered them the decrees for to keep or guard that were ordained of the apostles and elders, which were at Jerusalem. So in other words, these cities have been hit hard by the Judaizers influence and said, you've got to be circumcised. And remember, who, who lives in Asia Minor? A bunch of Jews? No, it's typically Gentiles. There were Jews there but they were typically Gentiles in this Asia Minor region. And the further we get west on this second missionary journey, the less you're going to encounter Jews and the more you're going to encounter Gentiles. That's natural. That's just the way of the geography and the political geographical landscape of the time, okay? All right. 
So uh, he's encountering Jews and Gentiles, but everybody's being told that you have to be circumcised. That's a Jewish practice. You have to give sacrifices and keep feast and, and, and uh, 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 what's the other one? Observe certain days and observe the Sabbath ritualistically. Guys, have you seen the, the list of things that people said you couldn't do on the Sabbath? There were these, these extra biblical set of rules to help interpret the Bible called Talmuds, I'll quote one today, that basically uh, gave a particular rabbi's understanding of, in a sense, that's what Jesus did when he traveled around. He was a rabbi, he had his 12 disciples, and he was teaching on the Old Testament. He really turned it on his head in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is super cool, I love it. But, but these, these rabbis would all do this. And so some of these Talmudic teachings would say, you're not allowed to look in a mirror on the Sabbath day, lest you, what, see a gray hair and want to pluck it out, and you've caused yourself to be tempted. Does that make sense? Our refrigerator has a Sabbath mode. Really, it, our refrigerator in our house presently has what they call Sabbath mode. And I, I Googled it because I'm like, there's no way it can mean what I think it means. And sure enough, it does, because it, it helps people who follow Judaistic religion uh, to, to not do any work on the Sabbath. And the refrigerator can't do as much work. Or, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still figuring it all out. But And I'm not trying to ridicule. Yeah, Kim. That's exactly right. Uh, they would say, oh, you're a Gentile. You can work on the Sabbath, which is like, mm, I have an example, but I don't want to. It's like going out to, to a restaurant on Sunday and yelling at people for working on Sunday. Well, they wouldn't be working if you weren't there. I'm just saying, if you want to go to a restaurant on Sunday, I do. I'm not saying not to do it. I'm just saying you can't say, well, you should be in church. Dude's been working seven hours. And then to make it, oh, well, I'm not, not going to get That's a hobby horse. I got a real big thing about how we treat people, especially people in the food service industry. Be nice. All right. Oh, I'm going to get there. I am. I can't jump ahead. All right. Here we go. Okay. So their mission right now is to show these churches why the Judaizers were not right, that there is freedom in Jesus Christ. Follow Jesus. He said, I want to keep the law. I want to, number one, you can't keep the law perfectly. If you want to start trying now, it's already too late, okay? Well, I need to, I need to follow these rituals and these feast days and these Sabbath days. You can't do it perfectly. You can't. That was never the point was to try to get anybody to be perfect. It was always to bring people closer to the mind of God and eventually to show us why Jesus was the only salvation. So while in this area, Paul heard of a young man who was, um, uh, I don't know why I did, uh, marchu, marchureo. Yeah, marchureo. That comes from the same Greek word as martyr, which means what? Witness, right? So a marchureo was someone who was considered to be a good witness. Now, what does that mean? Somebody who had a good testimony. Even today, somebody might say, oh, boy, you don't want to do that. You might hurt your witness. Right? You see, that phrase is uttered a lot, sometimes uttered out of context, mostly probably uttered out of context, you know. You don't want to laugh in public. They might hurt your witness. Well, all right, you know, you get it, right? But the idea of having a good witness is important. I say it is very important. In fact, that's really the whole theme of this lesson today is having a good witness. But a martyreo is, it's also translated as someone who is, well, you read it in your King James, it's right there in front of us. Um, I have looked at other translations. I think the King James did just a fine job here. It says that he was well reported of. He was of good report. What does Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 say? Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, what? Good report. Think of these things. He was of good report. He was well spoken of. He had a good reputation. Not just in the world, but what does the Bible say? Well reported of by the brethren. So other Christians looked at this guy and said, this guy's the real deal. This guy's the real deal. Hey guys, I'll be really honest with you. Depending on how dark your environment is, even a very dim candle can appear very bright. And that's a good thing. Does that make sense? People can say, oh man, that guy is awesome. And you might go, oh, I don't know if I'm awesome or not. But, but of course, they, a lot of them will think that because of how dark the environment is. Does that make sense? But when other Christians look and they say, that guy's the real deal. I know his lifestyle. I know his witness. I know his reputation. That is, that is, that is, that is something desire to be spoken of me and something you should desire to be spoken of you. That we are people who other Christians would recognize as godly people who are of good report. Does that make sense? I hope it does. All right. So moving right along, his name was uh, Timotheos. We say Timothy, right? But Timotheos, Timo meaning like dear to, and Theos, of course, meaning what? God, right? So for the Greek name, it wasn't a Hebrew name. Theos, right? And the name should indicate to you, this is the Greek name. Does that make sense so far? Um, we're going to get into his heritage here in just a second. His mother was a Jew, literally a second. How about that? And his father was a Gentile. Since they were a blended descent, Timothy was not circumcised. 
there had been a lot of thought about why Timothy was not circumcised, despite the fact that his mom was a Jew. It seems likely, given the time, um, let's put it this way. This was still in the first century. Women were not very well listened to, especially in their home, which is why Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, when he said, husbands, love your wives, wives submit to your husband. But then he talks about like, love your wives and give yourself for them as Christ loves the church. That wasn't your average rabbinical teaching, ladies and gentlemen. That was turning everything upside down on its head. In fact, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, wives, your body belongs to your husband. That was common teaching. But then when he said, husband, your body belongs to your wife, that turned everything upside down. That means men could no longer just act like depraved pigs and treat their wives like property. Are you with me? You say, well, people still do that now. I know, that's why we need the Bible. Well, Christians still do that now. I know, that's why they need the Bible. Yeah. Anyways. So, anyways, in this society, if mom was a Jew and dad was a Greek, mom seems to be a believing Jew. Dad does not seem to be a believing Greek or believing Gentile. We actually get that. Um, well, let me go to the next slide. Um. Notice that Luke says the mother was a Jew and believed, but his father was a Gentile, not and his father was a Gentile. There's a reason for that in our text. Um, along with the content from Paul's later letter, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, um, what did he say? Yes, he said the faith that was in your grandmother and in your mother. He didn't say father, right? When Paul's writing to Timothy, he said the faith that was found in your grandmother and in your mother. That seems to me between that and this text seems to indicate that Timothy's father was not a believer in God. So imagine you're in a home, you're a Greek, um, your wife is a Jew, you guys have a kiddo. Is that kid going to get circumcised? Not a chance because that would be one of those religious things, right? That'd be one of those religious weirdo things, the invisible sky daddy thing, right? No, come on. This is we live in a rational society, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to believe in whatever ghost or fairy tales or unicorns you're preaching. There's no way my kid's going to get circumcised. Get the idea? That's what's going on here. So it seems to be that's what's going on here. I can't say that with authority. It's very likely what's happening. So it's possible, by the way, that he was actually dead at this time. Of, of a curious note, uh, the Maccabean War. It doesn't matter. It's, that's ask me later about another Timothy that, that could be linked. But anyways, all right. I got to get to the text. Okay. Um, also of note is that Timothy's grandmother, who lived and died before Christ, had faith in Christ. In 2 Timothy 1.5, he says, your grandmother had faith. The faith that's in you was once the faith of your grandmother. But that's before Jesus ever came and lived and died and rose again, right? Well, then, then what is he talking about? Because people were saved then just like they're saved now. Faith in God's promises, faith in the coming Messiah. We now believe in faith in the Messiah who came and will come again. But it's always been faith in what God revealed to people. So anyway, just a thought there. And then Timothy's mother, listen carefully, was likely raising her son without the help. Maybe maybe dad had even passed away. But even if he was still in the picture, he was certainly not in the picture spiritually. So mom was raising this precious boy by herself spiritually. Did that still happen today? Yes. Does God still use it today? Yes. Many of you can, can testify of the fact that it was a mom who brought you to faith, not a dad. Now, some might say, well, it was actually my dad, not my mom. But for, for a number of reasons, some of which are, are, are understandable, some of which remain a mystery to me, it is, it is overwhelmingly mothers who invest in their children and lead them to the faith much more than fathers. Could be, especially in our society, uh, in a society like this one, mothers were home all day with their children and not fathers. You get the idea. Um, you say, well, women are just more gullible. Paul said women. Were, well, I don't know if I want to go that far because here's Timothy, and he is he's believing in the faith that his mom taught him, and he's living it out. Here's Paul, one of the smartest guys you'll ever meet, and he's living it out. This is not a gullibility issue, I don't believe, as much as it is a, a, a nurturing, loving uh, institution of the home in which the mother is instilling faith in the child. Yes, quickly. Yep. So that's, yep. And so many of us have stories like that for sure. I agree completely. Absolutely. Um, and it's so important. So we say, boy, I'm just, a, I'm just a mom and my husband doesn't really want to help with this. Don't think it's futile. Don't think that, don't think that your efforts are in vain. Timothy, one of the greatest missionaries who ever lived was raised by a mom who, whose dad had nothing to do with the faith. I think there's something there. And that's, this also will counter your Mother's Day sermon in a couple of months. So enjoy this. Anyway, I'm just joking. All right. But I'm telling you what, it's good, it's good Bible. And all right, here we go. 
Paul, if you'll notice in verse 3, took and circumcised him. Circumcised Timothy. Now I'm going to turn to a text. You certainly don't have to turn there, but uh, this is in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Listen to what Paul says about circumcision, and then we're going to double back on this verse. Is any man called or saved being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. In other words, don't let him disregard that. That's an important part of his life. And then he says, is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. In other words, it's not important to be circumcised. That has nothing to do with being in Christ. Very clear. Paul's been very clear about that his whole, his whole life. Verse 19 says, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. You want a sign of salvation? It's not circumcision. It's keeping the commandments of God. Does that make sense? So then why in the world is he kind of disobeying his future self by bat baptizing? <laughs> no, not the same thing. By circumcising Timothy here. So some have taken this to mean that the author of Acts, we say Luke according to tradition and according to the internal witness of the Scriptures. Internal witness is just a fancy word of saying the Scriptures themselves seem to indicate that it's Luke. Um, it's not some sort of internal witness to the Holy Spirit. That's not what I'm referring to here. It's just a, a literal term. But why then would Paul be doing this? Some, some have deduced from this apparent contradiction that, that this isn't the real Paul in Acts. This is just a made-up story, and Paul would never do that. But because it's so different from what Paul would normally do, Luke feels like he's got to give a little bit of explanation. Does that make sense, Rev? Thanks for ruining everything, Gav. No, I'm joking. No, I think that's, I think that's a, a really big part of why. Check this out. Um. Some have suggested that according to Jewish law, this is Talmud Yevamot 45b. 45b, you say, what in the world? It's a Talmud again, it's just an extra commentary on the Bible where, where a bunch of rabbis are sitting around saying, this is what this means. And if you read Talmud Yevamot 45, it has to do with children who are born out of wedlock, children who are the, uh, um, the result of, you know, a, a um, how do I, how do I, a violent union of man and woman against the woman's will. I'm just trying to know my audience. Does that make sense? Um, all kinds of situations that are tragic. The Talmud, these, these rabbis, they're saying, what is, what, the Bible doesn't exactly tell us exactly what to do in this scenario, so what do we do? And they're doing what Christians today do, is we try to build theology around what the Scripture does say, okay? Uh, by the way, notice how the answer was never kill them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the answer is never get them off of the face of the earth that they're unplanned. That's, that's, that's abhorrent. It's morally reprehensible, and it's fundamentally evil. Now, do I believe we need sympathy? Absolutely. Do I believe we need sympathy to people in need? Absolutely. Do I think we need to actually provide alternatives rather than stand on street corners and tell people just how terrible they are? Absolutely. Which is why we fund places like CareNet that say, hey, there's there's resources. If you're with child and you don't know exactly what to do or where to go, we're here for you. Does that make sense? Because it's really easy to throw rocks at people and say, you're evil. It's a lot harder. It requires more financial investment and time investment to actually help people instead of wagging our fingers at them. Just saying. Anyways, moving right along. Um, so, listen to this. Timothy was effectually a Jew since children in his situation inherit the lineage of their mothers. This is called matrilineal descent. Um, but Timothy's father, so he would have objected to the circumcision, so this might have been Paul's way of remediating that, saying, hey, you really are a Jew. Because you're born to a Jewish mom, this Talmud says that you're a Jew at heart, so let's, let's do what should have been done at your birth and get you circumcised. That could very well play a part in this. However... Uh, yes, Ray. Absolutely, and I think, and that's going to play into the answer too in a second. So it had to do with enhancing a good testimony among people, um, which is exactly where we're going. So, um, really quickly, the answer about matrilineal descent is only half right, since matrilineal descent has been convincingly shown to have not been in effect in the first century. It was only kind of started in the second century that it was universally recognized. So this could have been an early version of that, uh, but it wouldn't have been the only reason why Paul circumcised Timothy. So uh, then why? If Paul knew it wasn't necessary for salvation, and later would make his stance very clear that circumcision was not necessary, then why would he circumcise Timothy? Well, the clearest answer comes from Luke's commentary in the Bible itself. The Bible says he took and circumcised them because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. 
So most, scholar, most scholars have come to the conclusion that if Timothy was a full Gentile, Paul would not have circumcised him. Did Paul circumcise Titus? No. Titus was a Gentile. So why would Paul circumcise Timothy? Well, it's a couple of reasons. It's not because of Paul's personal commitment to the Jewish Torah. Though we know Paul was very committed to following the Jewish Torah's tradition. That's what he was his whole life. He didn't continue to make sacrifices. The author of Hebrews made it very clear that that was blasphemy because Jesus was the final sacrifice. Does that make sense? But I believe Paul still uh, observed feast days. I believe he still observed the Sabbath within reason. Um, here's, here's my deduction. It was almost certainly because the notion of an uncircumcised Jew during this time and around this audience would have scandalized the gospel unnecessarily. Unnecessarily. What do you mean? In other words, Paul did whatever it took to make sure that we wouldn't be adding offense to the gospel. That's, that's exactly right. There were the people who came in, and 2 Corinthians was written to contradict what they called a super apostle, the one who came in and they said, yeah, well, Paul doesn't even take a salary from you. We take a salary. That's how you know we're the right guys. I know that may seem a little backwards, but oof, right? Crazy. Um, all these super apostles said, yeah, well, Paul did this and Paul did that. And so Paul ended up writing this letter to the this, this second letter. Well, actually the fourth letter, but we call it Second Corinthians uh, to the church at Corinth. And he said, guys, do you want to know who the real apostle is? Look at yourselves. Check and see if you're in the faith. Are you a counterfeit? No, then I'm not a counterfeit. That's what the end of Second Corinthians is. It's really, really cool. Susan. Well, abstaining from blood actually had to do with the pagan temple ritual of eating things that were often sacrificed to idols, or, um, and I know this sounds a little bit grotesque, but consuming animals while the blood was still in them. And you say, well, that's, that's not okay. That's gross. There was drinking blood. There was eating animals that were, you remember how it says uh, things strangled and from blood? They would, instead of killing an animal, they would strangle the animal so that no blood leaves the animal. And so that all the blood would remain in the animal's carcass for consumption. You say, that's disgusting. Of course it's disgusting, but it was a pagan ritual about consuming the blood. And it's something that they did in pagan te uh, temple surrounding some of their more, uh, I don't know how to put this, but a lot of Greek and Roman temple worship was very sexual in nature. And that's only the half of it. And that's why fornication is also listed in the Jerusalem Council's advice, was because those were all things they did in pagan temples that were absolutely inconsistent with the Christian testimony and with following Jesus. You can't serve both God and Baal or Ashtaroth or whoever. Um, so anyways, there's that. All right, so Paul didn't want to scandalize the gospel, because what did the Bible say? It's already offensive enough. It already, it already, it's a stumbling block. It's a stumbling stone. When people come face to face with the crucified and risen Jesus, Paul said, that's hard enough to get. Guys, people don't rise from the dead every day. You guys believe somebody rose from the dead? Yes, we do. That's enough. I don't need to make the gospel any harder for somebody than it already is. You say the gospel is easy. No, the gospel is simple and the gospel is clear, but nowhere in the Bible does it say the gospel is easy. It's actually quite the opposite. Because it requires that we take ourselves off of our intellectual and individual thrones and say, there's something bigger than me, there's something greater than me, and something I can't fit in a beaker or a test tube. I've got to follow Jesus. All right, moving right along. So Timothy, being teachable and willing, underwent a painful procedure for the sake of the gospel's free course. He did what he shouldn't have had to do so that others could know Christ. Well, I don't have to do that. I've got liberty. But what does the Bible say? Be very careful that your liberty doesn't become a stumbling block. Timothy had liberty. Paul had liberty to not be circumcised. But the Jews would have said, he's traveling around with the... By the way, half Jews and half Gentiles, were they exactly liked in the first century? Sure. <laughs> I love you, Pete. <laughs> sure. By their parents, right? Not by society, they're Samaritan. And so what did he do? Circumcision further solidifies the identity as a Jew. And say, well, that's, he shouldn't have had to do that. Nobody said he had to do that. Nobody said he should have had to do that. But what he did was he removed any potential stumbling blocks to the gospel. So what do you mean, Britt? All right. How do we apply this today? <laughs> well... I can think of several ways that I, I, again, I'm not, my goal, just like with that same principle, I don't want to make this message any more offensive than it has to be. 
But I think there's some real application to this principle in our lives. If you love Jesus, awesome. And you are always quarreling and yelling and hollering and you act like an absolute fool. You're, you're, you're barricading the entry to the gospel, the entry to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Um, guys, I, I don't know what to think about 9-11, chemtrails, gas stoves being harmful for your health, since I've mentioned that three Sundays in a row. I, I don't know. And there's probably a lot of truth to a lot of these conspiracy theories and stuff, but I'm not going to incorporate those into the gospel. I'm not going to make a gospel presentation and then tie it into why a Christian ought not, whatever it is you think. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly what the Judaizers were doing. They were saying Jesus plus, Jesus plus. And what that's done is produce a bunch of insufferable and repugnant clones of each other who are pushing people away from the gospel with their man-made rules and the things that you unofficially have to do in order to be a good Christian. Guys, there is no good Christian. <laughs> Jesus is good, and we follow the one who is good, and he's making us good, he's making us better, but it's all through him, not our own stuff. Yeah. So Timothy did what he shouldn't have had to do. Guys, the Christian life is full of doing things that you shouldn't have to do. Well, I shouldn't have to forgive that person. <laughs> I was almost snarky. <laughs> I shouldn't have to forgive that person. Okay, that's what forgiveness is. Um, debt is something that should be repaid. That's how it works. You sign on the line. I will pay you this money. I've told you at least 30 times because I'm apparently still bitter about it. The time I forgave a couple of men, their great debt that they owed me. Numbers in the four-digit zone, ladies and gentlemen. Not counting the change, brother. And I said, hey, Merry Christmas. You don't have to pay me back. And instead of, oh, may I serve you? It was, okay. I kind of wanted them to be like the story that Jesus told of the people he healed and the one came back. You know, chariots of fire theme playing in the background. Dun, 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 Thank you. No problem. It's my pleasure. I just want him to say thank you. And maybe have a parade, I guess, in my name or whatever. And name their children after me. Whatever, right? Little things. <laughs> What's that, Steve? <laughs> exactly right. I shouldn't have to forgive somebody of the money that they owe me. But that's what forgiveness is. Well, this person did something bad. Whether they did or not, whether it's actually bad, whether you just think it's bad, forgiveness is just saying, let it go. <laughs> you thought of the Frozen movie, didn't you? <laughs> there it is, man. <laughs> the sin doesn't bother me anymore, right? You get it? Let it go. Right, right. So it, here's the thing. And you know the Matthew West song, the person that you're really freeing is you when you forgive somebody their debt towards you. And that's entirely true. So you, the Christian life, if your Christian life is not full of doing things that you shouldn't technically have to do, you may consider the fullness of your Christian life. So this, this leads me to the crux of the lesson this morning, Timothy's character. I'll close with this. I submit to you that there's no more powerful witness or effectuality for the kingdom than the personal testimony and daily conduct of the believers. You can stand on street corners and shout all you want. And I'm, I mean that sincerely. You can. You can hand out 100 gospel tracts a day. Great. Um, you can memorize the entire Bible. Good luck. You can do all the things. You can... We had a tradition... I haven't told you this. This is great. A tradition, maybe I told you this once, where on deputation, where we went as missionary family to go raise money for support from various churches, we had a tradition where before we walked in, my dad would always take his binaca breath spray. Don't miss. Eye hurts. <laughs> then you walk into church, I've just been crying because God is good. Amen. Crying minty tears, you know. <laughs> Don't miss. But we had this thing where it sprays the breast spray. And so we three boys would line up. Mouth wide open, tongue hanging out. 
and dad would just reluctantly go and then, <laughs> we were like dad man it was cool we were like dad i however was you know me and spicy things i know i can't do anything i know welcome to my life and it just meant but as a child as a wee lad <laughs> so i stood there and i think the first time it would and then he sprayed I did not run away giggling. I'm like, it hurts so bad. So I developed a ritual where, this is the man-made commandment. This is one of the man-made laws, amen. I developed a ritual where, this is so gross. I don't know why he let me do this. I would lick the cap, the inside. You know, they're, they're like a lip. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No, but, but they're like a lip -tick. Ralph, not you two. Will you also go away? All right, anyway, so. <laughs> Anyways. So like a, like a lipstick tube, right, on the inside. It's just a very narrow. Think of a pen cap just a little bit bigger, right? And there was enough minty goodness on the inside of that cap that I would just try to stick my little tongue in there. And <laughs> I, Listen, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't know this was going to gross you out so much. Oh, family. family, I was seven. These germs don't count. Amber's like, tell you. I know. I, I, before I even saw your face, Amber's like, tell yourself that. Kids are like, Dad, I had this left over. I'm like, oh, maybe your mom will eat it. And I'm starving. You know what I mean? I just can't. Sharing forks. I don't know, man. I just, it's like sharing toothbrushes. How far would you go? Not me, all right? Anyways, I'd lick the cap, you know? And because we all had to have minty fresh breath for Sunday. And that's, hey, I'd recommend it, all right? It's better than, you know, people guessing what you ate last night. I get it, right? I brushed my teeth this morning. We should be brushing our teeth, showing up. Yeah, absolutely. Not just for church. General habits, all right? Good. We're not going to have personal hygiene class here at church. That's for never. Um, yeah, but I, just, I don't even know if they make it anymore. Probably some ozone depleting thing in there, but um, <laughs> that explains a lot. Let me, let me try to wind this down, land the plane here. Binaka is great, and it's a fun thing to do before church. But the minute that a church puts a sign out there that says, hey, 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 you got to have Binaka, fresh breath test. You know what I'm saying? Let's not let, you know what Timothy's fresh breath test was? It wasn't how well he was dressed or how fresh his breath smelled or how many Bible verses he knew or how many people knew, knew or how many, how good his grammar was or, or how many names he had jotted down in the back of his soul winter's New Testament that he'd won to Christ or persuaded him with some sort of tomfoolery. You know what, you know what his breath, fresh breath test was? It's how he lived every day. This is life. He lived a quiet, peaceable Pure life before God. Well, that doesn't make the headline. Yeah, you should have been here for Kevin's lesson in Ecclesiastes. We know. That's what the preacher was going on about. He said, in the end of your life, you, you will eventually be forgotten. I do not know my great-great-great-great-grandfather. I don't know them. No idea who they were. You say, I do. You are an exception, and I mean that sincerely. People just don't. Your name, maybe even your deeds will be forgotten, but your influence will not your influence changes generations and generations and generations after you. Well, I don't have children at home anymore. Who said I was just talking about your kids? Talking about the people you bump into every single day. I'm really trying to land the plane. Be patient with me. It was Nietzsche who said, this is Nietzsche, famous atheist, German philosopher, Russian philosopher, whatever. He said, German, excuse me. He said he would believe in the Redeemer if his followers acted more redeemed. That's not new, though. This century, this, this, this sentiment has been echoed for centuries before and since. And they have a point. I just talked to you about this. Christians often make the gospel look like a foolish, empty comfort. People, people bring an argument against Christianity, and we go, I don't know, Jesus is real. I talked to him this morning. Well, that might be a comfort for you, but that's not going to help anybody else understand why you follow Jesus. How about a little reason to go with your, your faith? You know what I'm saying? The Bible says you need to be prepared and ready to give an answer to every man that asks a reason of the hope that lies within you. And just saying, I don't care what you say, Jesus is alive, is not an answer. That's an assertion. And that's what leads a lot of people to abandon their faith because they're told as kids, no matter what you're told, Jesus rose from the dead. And I'm not saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I'm saying that if you, try, if you teach them to have a blind and stubborn faith, eventually that blindness and stubbornness will wear off and people will go, I have no actual foundation upon which to base my beliefs. People need to know why the Bible is true, why it is reliable, who Jesus was, what he actually said. And the more, the more man-made stuff we pile onto the gospel, guess what? It gets just as heavy as the law was, and people can't wait to cast it off. And a lot of times Christianity is being used as a power structure. 
the church state in the Reformation, the church state in the Roman Catholic era, the, and, and the increasingly odd religious nationalism that we're seeing in Capitol Hill uh, is also a, a thing. Are you saying Christians shouldn't be in politics? No, I, I, I am involved in politics. I'm a Republican national state county vice chair. Whatever I am now, I don't even know. <laughs> but I'm involved. But I'm saying politics will never be the answer. Jesus is the answer. Yeah. Ooh, boy. I tell, uh, the more public position you have, the more it is easy for you to make a fool of Christianity. Yeah, and we see that in politics a lot too. We do. I'm not going to miss words. We do. I'm a Christian. <laughs> okay, please be very careful what you say next to millions of people who are going to read the news tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right, yeah. Listen, very, care- very quickly, very quickly. Timothy was known by people as a man of good character, kind, balanced, good-natured, meek, knowledgeable. All thanks to mom and grandma, by the way, just touching on that again. So is this a sermon, by the way, on how we should all shape up and be like Timothy? No, that doesn't do any good. That's browbeating. That's nonsense. We're not, we're not into that. But it is a sermon that will direct us to the importance of a few key takeaways. Number one, how we raise children matters. Well, you know, if they're elect, they're going to follow Jesus. And if they're not elect, they won't. Oh, well. You say, that's a cruel mischaracterization of particular doctrine. It, it, it is. I'll, I'll agree it is. But I believe that God has given us children and people in our communities, entrusted us with the responsibility to influence them with a thirst for truth, a knowledge of the truth, and an ability to defend the truth. <laughs> yeah. Second, your testimony matters. Well, not a lot of people watch me. You would be very surprised, I am sure. I told I, I was given a blessing in Sunday school how this pastor friend reached out to me. And again, this is this is this is a, a dear friend of mine, but he had gone on to pastor a very large church and and uh, and he and again, I'm not I, I'm not you got to understand I speak as a fool, but this guy called me. And I was like, "What's he calling me for?" I'm a nobody. And he's like, "Yeah, I've listened to your podcast. Here's my two favorite episodes. Listen to them by name." I'm like, "I got to be careful what I say in all of a sudden." You know what I mean, though? You may not have a podcast and you may not be a pastor, but every single life, every single day of your life is an episode of your life cast, so to speak. That wasn't planned, so it sounds a little silly, but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And then third, the mission matters. You know, Timothy was like at home with his family and Paul's like, hey, come with. And Tim's like, okay. You know what I'm saying? Can you ever think about that? Paul's like, we thought it good to take him with us. Uh do you need like a parent permission slip? Or how long is this field trip going to last? You know what I'm saying? Like what? But the mission mattered. It mattered. And we could go on, but, but lastly, you matter. Oh, no, it's more than just a self-love thing. You matter. Your destiny is intertwined with the destiny of hundreds of people in your sphere of influence, maybe thousands or millions. Millions? Yeah, man. Millions. Every time you take two more seconds at the red light, at the green light, after it turns green, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, you're actually affecting the entire traffic pattern behind you. It's really cool. Sociologists and economists have looked at this stuff. It's incredible. Every time you breathe oxygen, you're affecting everything around you. Oh, guys, it's, it is mind-blowing to look into this stuff. Every word I say, every second that I'm here, listen, seriously, every second I'm here at this pulpit, it's a second we delay on eating and our afternoon discipleship class, and then we all go home maybe five minutes later than we normally would if I just shut up and sat down. You know what I'm saying? But those five minutes on the road change all the other traffic patterns all around, emanating for miles and miles. Isn't it crazy? And then somebody gets home two minutes later than I normally would, or somebody's late to work one minute because you insisted on going to speed limit, <sighs> which you should. I'm being sarcastic. I, 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 that always goes over so well whenever I bring up the speed limit. It goes over so well. What? Meddling, yeah, yeah, meddling. I thought it was like pedal to the meddling. You know, I'm like, yeah, well, that, yeah. But here's, but no matter, but but everything you do. So imagine if what you did was done in righteousness and instead of you know, carnality, how much of a difference it would make. And no, I'm not talking about the speed limit with that. I'm, everybody's okay. Last slide. As we come to the bread and the cup, let's be reflecting on how we ended up here. Thanks to Paul and also Timothy, we have a great faith to practice today by the providence of God. Well, I'd say thanks to God. Yeah, it is thanks to God. But you know something about God? It's he uses people as a means to his ends. Not as puppets. But it's his pleasure to allow you to be used in his plan. And it's our pleasure to be used by God in his plan. God is not some vindictive little um, narcissist puppeteer. (laughs) Well, they went to hell. That's part of my plan. No, no. 
God's plan is for the entire world to come to know him by faith. So, what can God do through you as you embrace what it really means to be a part of his body here on earth? Boy, I wish Jesus was here. He would fix everything. Just, I read this this week, and I'm not trying to indict you as much as I am about me. Um, I read that there's 1.5 homeless people for every church in America. I'm just throwing it out there for you. You say, yeah, but those homeless people got themselves in their predicament. Excuse me, how many predicaments have you gotten yourself into that you could have avoided with wise living? Right? Come on, guys. Okay, pay my mortgage payment. That could just spend it all on candy and weed. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Or both at the same time. That's available now, too. Pick your poison, right? Maybe it is completely your own fault. That doesn't mean that Jesus says, I only help people who had... Come on. Jesus, Jesus would help anybody. And helping doesn't always mean, helping doesn't mean enabling, helping doesn't mean, but helping means helping, honoring God, helping people. So with that in mind, it's just, it's just silly. It's a silly little thing. I just read it this week. It's not part of my notes, but there, two weeks ago, there's 1.5 homeless people per church in America of all denominational traditions. And we say, why doesn't God help the homeless people? If God's real, he'd help the homeless people. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. We're the body of Christ. Right? We're the body of Christ. Well, God would end world hunger and suffering. What can we do in our area to end hunger and suffering? You know, guys, it's hard. It is hard. It is demanding. It's hard, and it presses us into some uncomfortable spots. But it's not. It's not difficult to understand. We are the body of Christ. We are supposed to be the eyes and hands and feet of Jesus. Going where he'd go, sitting with the people he sat helping them the way that he did. Now, we can't multiply five loaves and two fishes by a miracle, but you know what we do have today? Like mass production lines and a little bit of money in our wallet. Guys, I'm just saying, why are you talking about homeless? Oh, it's not just homeless. That's an example. What other problems are there in this world that we think need to be fixed that we say, if Jesus were here, he'd fix it. He is here through us. We are the body. So let's consider that as we come to the bread and the cup. So here's what we'll do. Um, I'm going to have a word of prayer and then... Uh, I thought I, I thought about this. Um, we are going to sing. Let's sing. Remain seated. Lord, would you come up and play that for that next song? We're going to sing one verse of Jesus paid it all. And then afterwards, um, the, the, the cup and the bread, they're on the little tables in the back. So afterwards, we'll have just a moment of silence. We'll grab the elements, participate in the body and blood of Christ as a picture. As a picture, we aren't, you know, you know but uh, it's a memorial of Jesus who sacrificed for us. And think, as we participate in the body and blood of Christ in this picture, think about what he did for you and think about how you can be broken and spilled out for others, just like he did for us. And so let's sing that, uh, let's sing that song together. What number was that, Laura? 276? 276. Go ahead and remain seated. We'll just sing this contemplatively. I'm not going to rush through it. It's just one verse. Jesus paid it all, the first verse and the chorus. And think, if Jesus paid it all for us, how are we being willing to be spent for others? Are we like Timothy in that way? And again, I'm not browbeating you. Be like Timothy. I'm saying be like Jesus. And Timothy just an example of one of many who have been. And you say, but I am. I'm trying so hard. I'm not, I'm not coming down on you at all. I'm not at all. I'm saying this is the model. Jesus is the model. And what a blessed life it is. Just like, Je just like Paul said, I'm willing to be spent and spend for you. That's, that's Boy, that's good. Would you play that first note for me, Laura? All right, 276. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. 